But yeah, I was born two weeks late, and since I was bored in there, I grew a third nipple. No, it's, I mean, it's not a big deal. Like, lots of dudes have third nipples, so women too. Um, but no, it's just, it's, it's like tiny. It's like, you know, you have the two, and like animals have rows and they go down. Like, well, I have a third one here, and like some dudes have four and they have two here. Uh, that's my go to random thing. It's not a very good one. It's really no, not. That's no, good. that's very interesting. You were the first person I've met with three nipples, so. That's that's a new one for me. I can cross that off my bucket list now. <laughs> <laughs> that was on your list? Meet someone online who has three nipples. It's really not that uncommon. I wish I had like a number for it. Um, it was actually percentage the one. So, yeah. It's really it, was, it was what? It's number one on my list. It's really important to me. No. Oh. <laughs> Must not be a very interesting list. Holy shit. I'm sorry. Your standards for excitement are really low. I don't know what Jeffrey Tucker's got you doing all day, but oh man, I feel sorry for you. Serving in martinis? Oh, I wish that would be fun. I wish we had a physical <laughs> bar. That would be, that would be well, I guess I guess you could. I started drinking recently. That's probably more interesting. I so after what do like you mean ten you years. As in you... Really. I'm not yeah. sure whether to say congratulations or whether it's not, you know, maybe it shouldn't be. Well, I don't know. I, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm like, I wish I could say I was drunk right now. Maybe I should, like, or I should, I should order a drink. Um, no, I. I mean, we could, we could I, just go and make drinks right now and come back. But I'm, I'm sure nobody would mind. All right, you want to go first? We'll make this. We'll make this Adam's happy hour. I got I got drinks because I because I started like I said I started drinking recently. I'm ready to go here. Um, right. I wasn't planning on. I'm gonna go. I'm, I'll be. You know, go make right. good? You go and I'll explain to people why I just started drinking, and we'll tell everybody else to go get a drink, and we'll make this a lot of fun. And I got I got um I think I got sake. No, what do I have? I, I have gin. I, I'm a gin drinker. Um, as of as of like two weeks ago. Uh. But go go ahead, and I'll I'll explain to everybody why I just started drinking okay, again. I'm not I'm not going to make one unless you're going to make one. I am, but I'm we're gonna should we we got to take turns. Okay, I mean, this we'll is quit. we can't okay. All right. pre-show bullshit session laps. All right, go go go. Okay, going. <laughs> All right, everybody, it's just me now. Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, and my phone is going crazy. All right, so I stopped drinking when I got back from Iraq because I was dealing with PTSD. And I realized, like, I was a heavy drinker in college before that. And I was a reservist, so I called my tour in Fallujah my semester abroad. And I enjoyed it. Like, it was a great challenge. I was in combat. You know, I didn't have to shoot anybody. Um, uh, I was very lucky in that sense. But I, I did torture people, and I, I spent a lot, of times coming, a lot of time coming to grips with that. And... I ran a peer support group for vets with PTSD when I was uh, when I was living in D.C. Uh, working with Iraq veterans against the war called Homefront Battle Buddies, and I I stopped drinking because in the way that alcohol releases your inhibitions, for me it was like releasing the negative things that were like good inhibitions that were holding back PTSD symptoms. So once I once I got to the point where I could I, I like and now I feel really comfortable drinking because. I'm completely, uh, I, I would, I, you know, again, PTSD is a really bad way of describing it because it's kind of like on a spectrum. Uh, I, I like to leave the D off. It's not a necessarily a disorder, but post-traumatic stress. And when you've come, I, I think it's more that I've experienced so much more interesting trauma since getting back from Iraq that my Iraq trauma is like almost irrelevant. Uh, you know, going to jail, solitary confinement, dealing with the, the psychopaths in my life recently. And... Now I'm. Uh, it was. It was actually spurred by the uh, fact that I, I had to quit smoking marijuana for my probation, and now I, so I, I started drinking, and I've, I've I've been really enjoying it. I used and it's funny because I used to really make fun of people for like alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, status drugs, you know, uh, alcohol, or uh, what was it? it was. Uh, caffeine, work hard, nicotine, die young, and alcohol. Forget that you're a slave. And I was, I was a real drug snob about it. And now I'm just like, no, no, no. You know what? Everybody have a good time. Do what works for you. And um, I'm drinking again. All right. I'll be right back. Keep them entertained. 
Okay. You like your drugs state free. Good luck finding drugs that are state free. Every there is nothing but state free, Bob. Did everybody get a drink? Did anybody get a drink? So I'm drinking whiskey out of my 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 Little Pony cup. Okay, Blue, come here, lay down. Wait a second, wait a second. Marianne, what are you drinking? I'm drinking Jameson out of a My Little Pony cup. Interesting, interesting. I thought since this was kind of spur of the moment, we'd, uh, we'd keep it classy. This is a Tanqueray straight I out of like the bottle. Tanqueray. We'll see. Tanqueray is good. Have you ever had that one? Yeah. Tan what was it? Tanqueray Ranker, it's the, um, the lime one. No, no. We'll All see right, how drunk so I can are... get in an hour, and then we can get really interesting for the. We'll see. We will get some really interesting questions going here. But all right, it's uh, six thirty-seven. I think by libertarian time, it's uh, six thirty. So let's do it. All right. Um, welcome everybody. We're really excited that you're here. Um, this isn't our usual format, but you know we're just gonna go with it. So. I'm really excited to introduce Adam Kokesh. Most of you know him as the host of Adam vs. the Man. He's also an author, a former congressman who, well, formerly ran for Congress, not former congressman. Is that is that a sore subject? Do you not want people to know no, I'm status? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. No, it's embarrassing. But no, I'm I'm proud to say that I lost because I'm not a good enough liar. Sorry. It's all right. I lost mine, too. Okay, so he also fought in Iraq, and he was a member of the Marine Corps. He, let's see, what else do they have me saying about you? It's not true, I swear to God. He, and he just wrote a new book called Freedom, which is what he's here to talk to all of you about tonight. So without further ado, I will give it away to Adam. Thanks. That's true, and I just want to say... This opportunity and it's cool to be an author all of a sudden after you know being an activist and a rabble rouser and a podcaster and a youtuber but part of the evolution for me was also killing adam versus the man that's right adam versus the man is now a dead brand it is my former self an old public persona if you will and i think part of the evolution i, I don't want to say that i'm i'm not as confrontational anymore but not as oppositional I want to confront people's cognitive dissonance, as some people know me from my man on the street videos, uh, youtube.com slash Adam Kokesh, uh, where I've had a lot of success with, uh, you know, like stick mic interviews, putting people on the spot in a, in a Socratic dialogue format, which is very uh, non-oppositional and, and very inviting for people to challenge their assumptions and, and think differently. So Adam versus the man is no more. It's just me, Adam, Adam Kokesh, the author of Freedom. And the new website is thefreedomline.com. So I hope people will check that out. The book we released officially on July 4th. And it's just been amazing to see the response since then. The virality of this book is incredible. The enthusiasm for it. And, and I guess I do need to show people. This is, this is like my, my big bragging of the last few days. Uh, I, I'm sorry I didn't have this pulled up because um, I, I really... I really um, I'm excited to see this because we, you know, as you can see on the screen here and on the shirt, the logo is uh, it's it's a pretty pretty badass logo, uh, pretty inspiring enough that we've got someone who has already got it tattooed on the back of her neck. I was I thought I was going to be the first getting it, you know, across my back as a, a full back piece, but no, someone beat me to it, and you know we were at something like forty thousand downloads if you count uh, the sixteen thousand views for the audiobook on YouTube, and it's just been really, really exciting to see the response. But I'll, I'll take a step back and tell the story about writing the book, which started for me when I was in jail. And for those of you that don't know, I do a lot of civil disobedience, or at least I used to before my latest round of felony civil disobedience, which put me in a kind of different category. And for making a video on Independence Day last year, loading a shotgun at Freedom Plaza, yes, the very ironically named Freedom Plaza, two blocks from the White House. Oh, yeah, that calls for a drink. I hope everybody's having a good time tonight, too. 
And just to show you how unplanned this, uh, this, this crazy drug consumption is, yeah, I'm drinking gin straight out of the bottle. So uh, I ended up going to jail for four months and did two months in solitary confinement in what I refer to as my government-induced taxpayer-funded spiritual retreat. And the challenge was really what was going on on the outside and like being isolated from that and unplanned. And I did a really poor job anticipating what was going to happen. I wasn't ready for it. I had some people working for me that were shady, unfortunately. My money uh, that was raised for my legal defense fund was stolen while I was in jail. But on the inside, I was having a great time. I mean, plenty of time to sleep in, catch up on reading, uh, excuse me, do some yoga, work out. Although the first three days, I was in kind of a torture chamber. I know it's a bit of an exaggeration, but like I said, I tortured people in Iraq. So um, and, and relatively mildly, but I'm uh, sleep deprivation, things like that. But I'm um, I'm in a very small club of people who can say that I have tortured on behalf of this government and been tortured by this government. So the first three days that I was in jail, I was refusing to cooperate and ended up in a room with the lights on 24 hours a day where I didn't have a mattress. I was in shorts and a t-shirt and it was too cold to sleep and there were ants in the cell. And I was on a, what for me as a 200 pound dude was a starvation diet of three bologna sandwiches a day. And in the first three weeks, I know this because I was transferred, I lost 15 pounds. And then uh, I gained it back later. But I was in solitary for the first two months that I was in jail. And it was during that time that I, I came up with the idea for this book. And this, the book really is unique in a lot of ways. And, and I, I, I've always thought that the most important thing we can do for the movement is win converts, like to get people to embrace true freedom, the message of freedom based on self-ownership, the non-aggression principle, the idea that you owe yourself and it's morally wrong to use force against another human being, and, and to have the intellectual consistency to want to apply that universally and see how that makes any kind of coercive government monopoly illegitimate. So. I've always thought that like with Adam versus the man with my media production, you know, and I had a radio show at first, like I ran for Congress. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I uh, ran for Congress in 2010 as a Republican in New Mexico, and I couldn't shut up when the race was over. So I, I got a radio show and then it got picked up as a TV show right before that was going to get canceled. And then the TV show was canceled. Uh, this is, of course, by the Russians because I was on RT America for political reasons after four months on the air. And I decided to go independent, knowing that this is the future of independent media, that you can support yourself because people like you who believe in the message will support independent journalists. And I'm kind of getting away from that now to focus on the book. And I do uh, my podcast just once a week on Mondays as a call-in show, 6 p.m. Pacific time, adamversustheman.com slash live. And I'm actually writing an entire book series based on, uh, on the book as follows. And we can, we can come back to that later. Let me, let me write that down. And um, it, was, it was really exciting at first to, to be able to step off and you know, say that I'm, I'm going to have faith in, in the movement and the, my fans and people who support this message to make it possible for me to be an independent journalist online and, and to produce YouTube videos and podcasts. And it was, it's really been an incredible experience for the last few years to be able to do that. So... I got, you know, I, I get emails still like every day from people saying, you know, it was you that woke me up, you know, you did this. And, and I've, I've looked at that, I've studied that and thought about, you know, like, what is it that really wakes people up? And I have to be really humble when it comes to this kind of conversation because it took me about 10 years. Yeah. And it's pretty dense. Uh, I was a libertarian in high school because, hey, I'm not going to be a lame Republican or Democrat. Screw that. What are, what are my options? Oh, yeah. Libertarian, leave me alone. Sign me up because you know, like I was, I was a punk kid. I got in trouble a lot and uh, got kicked out of a high school. So I was, you know, it was a you know, drink to that to everybody who's gotten kicked out of a school or a bar or a nightclub or a church, whatever the case may be. And I, uh, ooh, that's better with tonic and lime. Anyway. I've always thought that, that, that converting people was more important than you know, winning people over on an issue or you know, getting them to change a position or to think a different way or even building an audience or covering the news from a libertarian perspective or you know, getting in the headlines. And I've made national news, I don't know, half a dozen, dozen times, depending on how you want to count that. And 
it's, it's always been great and I've always thought, okay, well, it's a good way to build my audience and bring people in, but if my media operation isn't you know, right for everybody, then they're going to see me on the news and they're going to come and watch an episode or watch a couple YouTube videos and then go back to their normal status lives. So I, you know, I, I've always asked people this when I meet libertarians, you know, how did you wake up or what converted you? And for myself, like I said, it was a very long process, but there was a, a critical turning point for me and it was reading Ethics of Liberty by Murray Rothbard. And I know, I know like, um, I don't know, raise your hand. I know we have a raise your hand button, right? If, uh, if, if Rothbard woke you up. And I, and I think, you know, there's, like, you know, look at Ron Paul and the incredible effect that he had in growing the movement. A lot of the people that he brought into the campaign, like, disappeared afterward. But the people that read Rothbard stuck around. The people that, like, internalized that message and saw, like, what he was basing his message on really embraced it at a, at a deeper level. And I thought, like, what, what are the, uh, you know, what are the, the problems with this? Because, you know, most people are with, with the books in existence, you know. And, and for me, like, Ethics of Liberty, I didn't even read it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's funny. I'm here as, as an author. I, I barely even read books. I, like, I, I listen to books. You know, that counts, right? But I listened to uh, Ethics of Liberty while I was running for office, and it was a, it was a major turning point for me. And, and what I found is that it really takes that kind of intellectual engagement and private personal introspection to, uh, to, to, to accept the message and really internalize it. And I see there's a comment here from Bob, um, audiobooks. Yes, another one, audiobooks for the win. Audiobooks are fantastic. By the way, freedom is free. Despite what they tell you, freedom isn't free. No, freedom is free. And you can get it at adamversustheman.com slash freedom, including as an audiobook. Um, and we'll come back to that because the distribution strategy for this thing is a lot of fun as well. But uh, you, you look, one of the cool things about this movement is that you can look to the literature, you can look to the history and see what's out there. And, you know, like I, I feel like I did before I went to jail a pretty decent survey of the literature. And so I knew what was effective, I knew what, had, what was out there, and I, I knew what the problems and the weaknesses with it were. So, uh, you know, most of the books that people are really converted by, first of all, they're too long. <laughs> you know, like, hey, you're not going to hand it to someone on the street and be like, hey, here's, here's 400 pages of Four New Liberty by Murray Rothbard, which is shorter than Ethics of Liberty, which is a lot shorter than Atlas Shrugged, which isn't really a true libertarian kind of conversion book. But it gets a lot of people started, got, a, got tons of people started. And, you know, you look at uh, the other works by Rothbard, you know, his, his closest thing is Anatomy of the State, which is, which is a great shorter philosophical treatise. You can look at The Law by Bastiat. I, I think that's great. But, you know, th th those raise some other problems as well. And, and the next one in my list here is, is that most of these books are too academic. You know, they're, they're not intended for the average person. And, and I say person, not American, but... Um, you know, the average American with the dumbing down thanks to the government-run education system, like, they don't, don't want to read books. I mean, it's been, like, beaten into them. Like, books are bad because it's, like, you know, something you do for school and it's it's punishment of some kind. And, and kids know. I mean, kids know that, you know, being forced in a school is is what it is. Like, they, it's, you know, to tell them it's anything else is to really insult their intelligence. But um, it, it, from from the books that I see, like uh, Foreign New Liberty, for example, it, it really is one of the best books out there for conversion, Foreign New Liberty by Murray Rothbard. But it's still relatively academic, a lot of historical citations, a lot of academic references, uh, you know, a, a lot of stuff like that in, in specifics that make it harder rather than easier for the average person to relate to it. So the other thing is that, that a lot of them are inconsistent. And if you look at some of the, like, you know, economics-based books, you know, there's a lot of utilitarian arguments as opposed to moral or deontological philosophical arguments. We're going to come back to that as well. Um, but the, the consistency of voluntarism as, as a philosophy or anarcho-capitalism that Murray Rothbard codified, and, and by the way, like, as much as I love Murray Rothbard, did you really have to do that to us, dude? You took, like, the worst two possible words for what we're talking about and put them together so that like everybody can hate this idea. But um, that consistency was lacking from a lot of the books that people, you know, made in attempts to create simple, easy to understand outreach books. Uh, the other problem, they're Amerocentric. Uh, you know, obviously they're based on the American experience or American examples. And, you know, here's, here's to America. By the way, 
We're going to have fun with the Q&A, so y'all better be drinking to keep up with me here. This this bottle was full, and we're, we're already down to, down to there, so I'm like four or five shots in already. All right, judgmental, and this is a bigger problem for the movement as a whole, but a lot of the books are judgmental about statists and about statism, and it's understandable Like when you realize, hey, this is nonviolence. You guys are advocating violence to organize society. Holy crap. You want to be like you're wrong and 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 it's terrible and how dare you you know you you evil statist you and that doesn't do it you know what I mean every everybody knows the guy that was converted by that angry Facebook conversation yeah me neither so I, that's a it's a big thing though to take it from being judgmental to to being a lot more matter of fact and and one of the books by the way and I, I want to really recommend this to everybody who cares about communication at all but especially libertarians doing outreach. To, uh, to wake other people up is um, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. And if you don't want to read the book, there's some videos of his workshops on YouTube. Really highly recommend it. Again, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. And it's about getting past judgmental language and being able to communicate directly with people your needs and your wants and uh, you know, your feelings in a way that, that you know, makes it possible to come up with collaborative relationships and share understanding rather than create oppositional conversations or dialogues. I mean, if you're going to talk to someone, like if you're going to stop and actually exchange words, like why would you want to do anything else? So it's, it's really powerful. And I think that's very important. The other thing is a lot of them are outdated. And as great as the law is, you know, I, and, and I think Bastiat, uh, you know, hundreds of years past uh, when he was writing, has, has, has served, uh, you know, as an incredible tool for a lot of people and, and helped a lot of people wake up. But for, for, you know, I, by the way, I, I just turned 30 for the third time. That makes me 32. I consider myself a part of the millennial generation. And it only, only if you use the more generous cutoff as to what counts as a millennial am I actually a part of the millennial generation. But I consider myself a millennial because I grew up with the Internet. And uh, for those of us who really have that mentality, you know, anything less than that kind of open-mindedness and access to information is is deficient somehow so it's really important to, to update that so I came up with the idea for this book while, while I was in in solitary confinement and I was like wait a second wait a second you mean nobody's written this book yet this dumbass like the, the, the guy that had to go to Iraq to find out that the war was a bad idea like, this dumbass who's in jail for civil disobedience, like, this dumbass who hired a guy who's stealing all his money right now while he's in jail, like, this guy gets to, gets to write this book? No no way. No way. And I looked around. I was like, no, it, it, it really hasn't been done. And, you know, one of the features of the book is that it's, it's very short. It's broken down in a very short subsection, so it's easy to digest. You can take individual parts of it as subsections and, um, you know, and, and, and go through it that way. Um, it's not academic at all. It's in very plain language. And I went through, and, and um, as uh, Marianne asked earlier, how long did it take you to write the book? Well, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about it when I was in jail. And what I did is I just, I just made notes. And I would just write down, well, the book has to include this, has to include this, has to include this. And uh, then I had all my legal stuff and in and out of you know, court and all that. And uh, then I got out of jail, and I spent three days working on the outline. And uh, really, you know, honing that and, and making it precise and, and being very careful with that. And once I had the outline done, and remember, the book's only 100 pages. Uh, it, it only took me like two weeks to write the book. Uh, it was spread out over like uh, maybe 30 days, but uh, there, were, there were days when I wrote eight sections, and it's, uh, it's only 60 sections long. So in, in two weeks, I had at least you know, a complete coherent rough draft, but as soon as I did, I invited 300 people to read it. And to I said poke as many holes as it as you possibly can. And I want to give two shout outs uh, for this. I, I do like to call it our book rather than my book because it was very much a collective effort. And as I say in the book, none of these ideas are original or my own. And you know, I, I don't claim and, and and condemning intellectual property in the book, I'm very clear about you know the idea that we we stand we see further because we stand on the shoulders of giants, but that the idea of Claiming an idea as your own, as original, is, is kind, of, um, kind of arrogant in a lot of ways. So um, it's completely consistent. Oh, sorry, the two shout-outs. So in, in the 300 people that I, that I asked to read the book, 
Uh, about 100 actually did. I know you. I, I asked a lot of people um, that, that I knew weren't going to read it, but it was about, uh, about 100 people that actually read the book. And uh, about 70 of them just gave me like the you know, thumbs up, liked it, it's good. Let me know when it's done because I want to share it. And then uh, about 30 of them, you know, read it closely and gave me some really thoughtful commentary. And it was it was about two dozen or about a dozen, I should say, that uh, that sort of read it line by line and really tried to poke holes in it. Jeffrey Tucker was one of them, and I'm grateful for his uh, his influence and his publishing consultancy on this as well. But the two shout outs I, I want to give specifically are for uh, Bob Murphy, who happens to be the funniest economist ever. If you don't know Bob Murphy, you should. And uh, I believe his website is bobmurphyconsulting.com, but you can look him up, uh, Bob Murphy, Robert Murphy. And uh, he's done a lot of great writing, a lot of great stand-up, a lot of great roast humor. Um, but uh, I, I asked people to poke as many holes in it as possible. And he did really an incredible job of that and uh, was, was really important to be making, to, to, to making the book philosophically consistent. And I think it was, you know, and, and linguistically consistent. I think this is very important. We overlook this a lot in the libertarian movement. And uh, I, I, I used to do this in my show. Anytime someone used collectivist language, like any, anytime anybody referred to the United States as we, instead of saying the government or, or whatever, you know, I'd say, all right, you got to put a quarter in the, you know, the, the status language tip jar thing. And, uh, you know, it's very important to have it. I had a lot of people that edited with that in mind. But the, the second big shout out I want to give is to uh, Victoria Higgins, or as I know her from her online persona, uh, Tori Higgs. And she really, re she read the book line by line and went through and questioned everything and challenged me on so much stuff. Um, but it really was a collaborative effort. Although it only took me that, you know, 30 day period or, or really two weeks within that to write the book, I spent the next uh, four or five months editing it and just, you know, you know just, just polishing it, polishing out like every, every little line, every word, everything I could do to make sure that it was, um, that, that there was nothing you could object to in it and that it was, it was consistent in its language. And, and I think, you know, because I had the kind of help that I did, uh, you know, I, I, I did a really good job in, in bringing all of that, you know, collective wisdom to bear to making it everything it could be. So obviously, now this is cool. If you read the book, you'll see what it means to have a philosophical libertarian treatise that's not a Merocentric. And it's, uh, it's really exciting to see that people, like I, we have a thread in the forums, forums.adamversustheman.com for translations. And people are just stepping up already. They're like, oh, we got to translate this. We got to bring this message to the rest of the world. Because if you wrote a book that was a Merocentric, like it wouldn't have that value. But I think, uh, again, the younger generation, the millennials, we, we very much understand that this philosophy is universal. It's global. It, it's not about the American government or the American experience. No, it's about the global phenomenon of statism and modern bureaucratic governments and the global status paradigm as what's holding America back. So that was really cool. Non-judgmental. Again, this is where like applying the lessons that I learned from reading nonviolent communication came in. And that you know you don't condemn the system. You don't even condemn the politicians or the status. And my background's in psychology. My my undergraduate degree was in psychology. And I you learn a lot when you study psychology at, at that level of depth about conditioning and how the environment shapes people. And yeah, this goes back to like the typical. Well, tell me about your relationship with your parents and what was your childhood like. And it's it's really true though that those things you know affect people and. One of the things that I learned from my recent experience with a couple of, of sociopaths and, and psychopaths in my life is that, you know, even, even for people like that, you ultimately can only pity people who aren't as fortunate as you in terms of having the positive upbringing or having the mental fortitude or perseverance or resilience to overcome. And when you understand uh, that, you know, Sociopaths either, you know, if they're if they're dumb, they become human leeches or con men. But if they're smart, they run for office and become successful politicians or you know corporate executives. And when you you know even like you look at someone like Barack Obama and you go, wait a second, he kills children with drone strikes, uh, hundreds of them, and is still doing this. And it hasn't even brought it up for all the protests and all the objections that other people have raised. And it's just like, no, that's a dude with no conscience. 
you know, you feel sorry for them and you want to reach out to them. And, and ultimately, it's, uh, you know, about reaching out to statists. If you, if you create an oppositional approach, you're going to drive them further away. If you, if you fight fire with fire, all you get is more fire. If you fight fire with water, hey, now you're on to something. So similarly, if what we're up against is, is violence, and if you understand statism as violence, you know, institutionalized coercion, the manifestation, or as I say, the institutionalization of all of humanity's worst desires to control and dominate and manipulate others with force, then, you know, you, you just, you want to pity those people. But how, what, how, how do you really, like, you, you know, and, and I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not taking some uh, pacifist approach here, uh, although I think, you know, that's, that's the future of humanity. Uh, I, I certainly assert the right to self-defense when it's absolutely necessary. But if you understand violence is, is caused by hate or deprivation or, you know, really the root psychological causes of violence, what do you meet that with? Love, understanding, compassion, empathy. And I think that's reflected in the book as well without being, you know, kind of overbearing or taking people um, out of what they're expecting in a, in a political philosophy book. Because it also covers, you know, the entire range of, um, you know, of, of the political issues. And I should be better prepared here and, and have the, uh, the, the table of contents pulled up. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and, and get that. So I, I do want to share with people that. But, but I guess um, the, the other thing is the idea of it being up to date in a unique way compared to um, former uh, or, or the... the, the all, all the previous libertarian manifestos. So um, there's an introduction. Chapter one is the philosophy. Chapter two, a brief history of power, you know, how we got here. Chapter three, war, the greatest crime against freedom. And there's, a, there's one section in there that, that I think is really cool, at least coming from my experience and being a, a, a combat veteran myself. It's, it's called soldiering. And it explains how, you know, Fighting, you know, being there's nothing, there's nothing brave, there's nothing noble about killing for politicians. And if you do, you're basically a sucker. And I and, and I'm really uh, particularly excited about how that section is being used in, as a standalone piece to to talk to people in the military to give give especially even more importantly to give high school students and young people some perspective on what it really means to join the military. Number four, personal security. And this is kind of the you know the standard justice stuff that, that libertarians like to talk about. Um, although I've got some unique takes on a couple things. Uh, taxation is chapter five, chapter six, economics, chapter seven. Other destructive government rackets had to have a catch-all, and that covers schooling, medical care, welfare, prohibition, the environment, intellectual property. Now, chapter eight, not really new material, but a little bit of a new way of categorizing it and bringing it together. It's called government and love. Sex, marriage, and family, children's rights, the evolution of parenting, bullying, and racism. Chapter nine, and this is where it gets interesting, and this is, uh, you know, there was one section of the book that I actually wrote when I was in jail. Here's to the government-induced taxpayer-funded spiritual retreat. And it's it really is my, my favorite section of the book. It's called Happiness Causes Freedom. I, I want to take a second to explain this because a, a lot of libertarians kind of miss this point. It's very important that, uh, th th that we take some perspective on the words of Thomas Jefferson, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, and, and we think of this as, as, a, as a sort of concept, as a series, right? Like um, one follows the other. You know, if you can't have life, you can't have liberty. If you can't have liberty, you can't pursue happiness. And if you look at it a certain way, it's true. It holds up. But, but I, what I came up with was a really uh, a different way of explaining this and that it's happiness causes freedom. Because, if, I mean, first of all, if you don't know how to be happy, what's the point of being free? If you're not free here in your head, if you don't know how to choose your own demeanor at any time, you know, what's, uh, you're not free. You're an emotional slave to yourself, to your past experiences, to the people around you that want to manipulate you emotionally. But if you have the power to simply say, Hey, I'm a free, independent, beautiful human being. I can choose my attitude or my outlook at, at, at any time. 
I know that happiness is a choice and I'm going to choose to be happy. You know, that's what causes freedom. It's having that internal freedom. So, I, you know, obviously you can, you can analyze this from, from every perspective and, and do it one way or another, but the four sections in this chapter are emotional slavery, health freedom, work freedom, happiness causes freedom. And uh, that was the one that I wrote when I was in jail, and I'm, 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 I'm very excited also to see how that one is being used as a standalone essay. Chapter 10, though, is where it really gets interesting. The Future of Freedom. And it's chapter 1, the, or section 1 is the asymptote. And um, for those of you who don't know, the asymptote is a term from geometry of, you know, uh, you know the point at, or, or an exponential growth curve, you know, or when, when a... A, a mathematical curve goes vertical or, or hits a, a, a you know a, a line, and I explain it better in the book. But uh, this is a, an important concept for a lot of libertarians to get as just at this point in human history, which is really exciting. Um, I mean, it's an amazing time to be alive, and for so many reasons. But we see so many exponential growth curves in the human experience going vertical, essentially. And, and yeah, I know an exponential growth curve never gets vertical. But from the perspective of our little monkey brains, it might as well be. And the most important one, of course, is computing power. And, and we all know Moore's Law, computing power doubles every 18 months or whatever it is. And what I mean by going vertical is, you know, from our perspective, like right now I could get on the internet and I could look up, you know, where's the fastest computer on earth? And, and it would tell me and I could say it's, it's this fast. But pretty soon, you know, we're coming to the singularity where we're going to have computing computers smarter than us if they're not already by some measures or with whatever the government is hiding from us. But it's coming to a point where computers will be making faster computers so fast that like the increases in speed in terms of our personal experience are pretty much going to be irrelevant. And one of the other exponential curves that, that drives is human productivity. And this is one of the things that the zeitgeist movement has a really good, uh, good ear to, although of course we know they have some silly ideas about property rights and uh, organization forcing everybody into this global system of blah, 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 central planning, blah, 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 whatever. Here's to the zeitgeisters who have since been converted to voluntarism. And by the way, a lot of libertarians discount the zeitgeist movement, but a, a lot of them, first of all, they're voluntarists. Like it's, and it's really kind of a cool thing to, to recognize that and talk to them and see that they're on the same page with that, with that core understanding. But... Uh, Zeitgeist has woken a lot of people up and, and brought them towards libertarianism, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I got to interview Peter Joseph and had a lot of fun, but I've also interviewed uh, and been invited to speak at uh, or interviewed a lot of Zeitgeisters. Uh, so you, some, of, some of those videos you can find on my YouTube channel. I've also um, gotten to, an invitation to speak at a Zeitgeist Day event in, in Baltimore a couple of years ago. It was a lot of fun. Um, so anyway. There's uh, human productivity coming to you know an increased point where you know uh, I, I, their concept of a post scarcity society is becoming really relevant. And I know a lot of libertarians out there are already excited about 3D printing. And you see where this is going. We've got nano 3D printing, you know, molecular 3D printing. And I, I, I'm thinking that we're going to have uh, plastic and metal on tap the way that we have water and electricity and the internet data on tap right now. So we see how this is taking off. Uh, someone in the, in the chat said 3D solar panels. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, it's a great example. But um, someone says, print me up some liberty, please. Don't worry. It's coming. Actually, uh, you, want, you want some printed freedom. I don't have any printed liberty, but, uh, but we, do have, we do have printed freedom if I can find it. Is it, is it here in the studio? Let me see. We have, um, yes, we do. The first 3D representation of the Freedom logo, 3D printed by our friend uh, Brigham Valdez. Yeah, shout out to him. He came up with this and a uh, very cool 3D printed version of the Freedom logo. But you see where this is going, right? I mean, eventually you're going to be 3D printing your food. You know, it's gonna, I, there's just like so many possibilities. I mean, with this technology, like where is it going? You know, are we going to have cars or you know, solar roads, right? No, 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 no. We're going to have, you know... Uh, um, drone taxis dropping little cabs out of the sky. You step into them and they take you up and, and fly you to your destination. I mean, like, all of this stuff is coming. You can see how we're on, 
a lot of these exponential growth curves. And, and if you're a libertarian, you care about where society is going. We're at the point now, like you couldn't say this in the 70s when Rothbard really first codified this philosophy, but you can say this now, like this stuff is coming in the next five to 10 years. Look at Bitcoin. I mean, you want to talk about destroying the underpinning of the status racket of the fiat currency scam? No, look, come on, guys. You got to be paying attention to this stuff. And this is why, you know, this chapter of the book is so important to me. So, and, and, and what I think is, is, is really somewhat original, although I will say the idea of happiness causes freedom, I'd like, to, I'd like to think, if I may, I don't know, please question this, doubt me, at, be ready with questions in a few minutes here. Um, I'd like to think that this is a, a little bit of an original intellectual contribution to the intellectual body of libertarianism, talking about happiness causes freedom, emotional freedom. Oh, I'm um, sorry, the, chapter nine, just to go back for a second, the four sections Emotional slavery, health freedom, work freedom, happiness causes freedom. That's this part. But then chapter, to back to chapter 10, the, the asymptote, uh, the next section is the internet effect. I don't think I have to tell you about that because, hey, look at what we're doing on the internet. But, you know, when you understand statism as violence, then, well, I, I'll say I had this, this fantasy. Don't get too excited. No, I had this fantasy that in some, at some point in our evolution everybody's going to get therapy robots yeah therapy robots like you know little little ipad floating around you know in your house on a stick or something uh hovering around and when you yell at your wife it says wait a second tell us how you're really feeling and you know there's you know, it has that kind of effect but you know anytime i look at these trends and i think adam well okay if you think this is going to happen you got to say how it's happening already now but how many of you have been able to connect to people online in ways that you never would have been able to without the internet? And I'm including things like Match.com, eHarmony, OkCupid. Okay yeah, but th seriously, in, in a lot of forums for abused children, for people dealing with psychopaths. Like, I've learned so much just in the last few months reading from support groups like that online. Things that never would have been possible before the internet. And since we're already having this effect of having everybody has therapy robots and is that therefore, you know, closer to personal actual, you know, full self-actualization and getting away from violence and things like that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the paradigm shift, that's uh, section three. I, I think people are aware of that, but, you know, we see how libertarian ideas, the, the ideas of universal nonviolence are really uh, taking hold. Um, section four, education, activism, and agorism. I don't think I have to explain that to this crowd. Chapter five, now here's a, or section five of chapter 10. This is a really important one. Again, something I'd like to think of as a bit of an original intellectual contribution to the movement. Here's drinking to my own fantasy. You guys better be keeping up. You better be keeping up. Tell me in the chat. Who, chat's, chat's over there. Right, right there. Who's drinking? What are you? What are you drinking? Hendrix. All right, good for for me. Marion, you better be uh, margarita pitcher number four. Wine and shots. Excellent, excellent. I hope someone's smoking weed too. And on Molly. Molly's a great drug, by the way. Rum and coconut water. Black Russian. Ox oh shit, we're getting some great fireball and weed, wine, Coors Light. Yes. All right, everybody's keeping up. Good to go. All right, so here we go. Localization. And again, this is not really an original idea, but I think it's there's some originality, and I hope that people would read this section. And you know, so far, like nobody's had any any objection to it. But the idea of how we move forward. Are there any South Park fans in the audience? I'll bet there are. A lot of libertarians are fans of South Park, right? Yep, yep. Oh yeah. Oh, the chat's blowing up now. Okay. Has everybody seen the Underpants Gnomes episode? If not, don't worry. All right. Yeah. Uh, I uh, respect my authority. Uh, everybody's watching South Park in another tab anyway, right? Okay, yeah, keeping it interesting. So it's like the Underpants Gnomes episode. Step one, underpants. Step two, uh, step three, profit, right? Okay, so I feel like that's the same. It's kind of like that with a lot of libertarians. It's like step one, paradigm shift. We're going to convince everybody's a libertarian. And then... Step two, uh, uh, government collapses. Everybody has 
gold and guns and and you know a bug out shelter survives and everybody else dies and and step three yeah free society and it's like you're not going to win anyone over with that you got to provide you know something that people can latch onto as a realistic means of transitioning to a voluntary society so all right we see from the chat agorism baby yes agorism is important as I already mentioned education activism and agorism is section four section five though localization and it's a matter of whether it's deliberate or accidental because I believe for my and this is very very much based on my subjective analysis of how things are going in the United States or with the current you know government forces where things are going um, localization is going to happen whether we want it to or not Go and this is governments coming apart from the top down and for those of you that don't know, I am running for president in 2020 on the platform of a peaceful, orderly dissolution of the United States federal government. And it would be a good first step. So this is what I really believe as the process of how we achieve a free society. Because, you know, and libertarians just really, like, have not combined this with the philosophy and had an answer as to where we go with this and something that's really consistent about achieving a free society. Now... You know, Sam Konkin, the, the originator of, of agorist philosophy, and, uh, you know, I highly recommend people reading Konkin as well. Uh, he talked about pockets of agorism expanding. I think of it more as like layers of, act, uh, layers of agorism, especially with Bitcoin, of people checking out of the, uh, you know, the, the fiat currency-based market, things like that. So it's, it's, it's very important, but at some point we got to go like, well, hey, what do we do about these institutions? What do we do with this property? And localization uh, has a lot of really incredible benefits if we do it deliberately and conscientiously. And we say, hey, look at the unjustly acquired property by government. And this is where, uh, again, a lot of libertarians have fallen short in what they present to people in terms of, uh, a, of a transition. And part of it is the, is the idea of property. Now, my response before I thought of this idea to liberals who said, well, what do you do about corporations? What do you do about all these rich people that have gotten all these wealth, you know, all this wealth from blah, 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 you know, and they wouldn't have gotten it without the state. And a lot of libertarians have like a pretty bad answer. And, but this is my answer. My answer was, hey, stop being so damn materialistic. You know, morality is more important. Nonviolence is more important. And I, I stand by that. I still think that morality and how we move forward and non, you know, establishing a voluntary society based on universal nonviolence is a lot more important than, you know, than, than the redistribution of wealth. But localization allows for a lot of reclamation of unjustly acquired property at the local level. And if you're a libertarian and you say, well, the only way to justly acquire property is by trading for it legitimately or homesteading or, you know, mixing your labor with natural resources, and, you know, then, then you've got to have some better answer for the, for the uh, materialistic liberals than, oh, don't be so damn materialistic. So this is where, again, localization comes in. The final section in, the, in the, the, this part of the book is, is this a revolution? It talks about, you know, the personal effect of this. And again, I think I think the part that I was able to come up with in the writing here that's been so effective in in getting people excited about this and spreading it and getting it tattooed on their necks um, is is pretty important because it's a personal revolution. And then there's the afterwards. So anyway, that's that's my rundown of the book and and why uh, I wrote it and organized it the way that I did. Distribution. This is all right. We got I got my little my my note cards here. One more toast for note cards. If you haven't told us what you're drinking yet, ooh, oh, you see, you see that level going down and down, 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 down. down. It's like, that's it's a, it's a lot of gin. I hope you guys are keeping up because we're gonna have fun in a few minutes here. We're gonna open this up to questioning in about uh, five, ten minutes. We'll see how long I ramble. All right, distribution. When you write a book like this, it's really hard to. Oh, really? Amber, I don't fucking think so. You can't stop the lecture until you finish it. This would fucking kill me. There's like there's there's this much gin left in here. Okay, this 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 much. Yeah, seriously. Let's vote on it. I don't fucking think so. All right. Whew. 
Recharging for round two. Back to the notes. Distribution. This is very important. When you write a book that completely condemns intellectual property, you better make it available for free. And one of the things I'm doing, and then I want to, I'm throwing this, here's a shameless plug for the distribution, all right, as if this wasn't a long enough infomercial for freedom as it is. Um, what we've got, we got the, everybody's, uh, Who's, who's ordered the book has been so far has been ordering it on pre-order. Um, but if you go to Adam versus the first, if you go to Adam versus the man.com slash freedom, it's available for free in every single digital format possible, including as an audio book. So please check that out and um, share it that way. But you knew that was coming, right? All right. Uh, the printed copies of the book, we are basically selling at cost. And I'm really excited. Like I, I want. I just want to get people to read this. Like I don't care about you know Adam versus the man or my media production or anything else. Really, I just want to get people to read this book. And you know, I'm hoping that maybe, you know, maybe I'll make some money on the back end with merchandise, whatever. You know, we're selling these T-shirts. They're pretty badass. You want one? Thefreedomline.com. We're taking pre-orders right now. Although we we've, we've got we got enough pre-orders. I want to say. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much to everybody who pre-ordered their books, especially people who pre-ordered 100 packs. Oh, man, it's getting warm in here. I don't know if it's me or the alcohol or both. But um, please uh, go to thefreedomline.com. If, you, if, you, if, you if, you, if you're sold on what this book is, if you want to help spread the message, you can get a 100 pack. Check this out. 100 pack with a T-shirt and a tote bag and stickers and bookmarks. For $139, that's right, 100 books plus all that for 139 bucks. We're getting these out as cheap as we can because one, we believe in the message, we believe in building the brand, and we believe in spreading freedom as freely as possible. So we also have on the page at adamversetheman.com slash freedom the easy print PDF version so you can print your own, seriously. And you know what, if you want to, if you want to print your own and undercut us, do it seriously. We don't care. Like we want to get it out. That, that's, that's that's all I care about. You know what? If you can get more people to read it, like my my name's not on the cover. There's a little about the author section, like hidden in the back of the book. If you can put your name on the cover and sell more copies than me, do it. I don't care. Like that's like I did that that when when you when you've come up with something like this and you want to just release it as as, as a gift to humanity. We'll drink to a little exciting hyperbolic language. Remember, I'm a new drinker. I have not been drinking for 10 years. This is insane. All right, so I, I hope that you guys are having as much fun as I am. The distribution is really important to be. So, same thing. Uh-oh, did we lose the connection? No, we have the professor coming in. Marion, all right. Did I, did I go past my like five to ten minutes thing? We're almost at an hour already. All right. Do we okay, want to start taking fine. questions? I, kind of did, um, I just wanted to come online in case you were ready to take questions because you sounded like you were. But if you're not, keep going. Um, I got a, a couple more things. Just a couple more things. Um, I want to say that one of the cool things about this book, as, as you mentioned earlier, Marion, about – you know what we, you know how good it is in the movement to have some optimism. I hope, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm representing some of that tonight. Um, although, I don't know, it might be the gin talking. Um, gin makes me optimistic. So does freedom. What can I say? Um, it's, I, I've heard from a lot of people who have read the book who were either minarchists and this converted them to true libertarianism. Uh, and by the way, I will say that minarchism really is a disgusting perversion of libertarianism. Uh, but that it cured their anger. And a lot of people who become libertarians, who, want, who, who are compelled by this message, who, who understand the importance of it, they get angry, they get depressed, they get sad, they get frustrated. <coughs> and then they go out in their activism and say, now join me in my fear and my anger and my depression. And everybody goes, fuck you. I'm going to go back to being a happy slave. But you know what? If you have an understanding of the truth that makes your life better, it's in so many ways. I mean, if you can question uh, you know, the government recommendations for what's safe to eat, for what's safe for drugs, for uh, what, whatever it is, you, know, you can live differently and be 
happier as a result. And what you should be saying is, join me in my love and my joy and my happiness. And I think you're going to have a little bit better time doing outreach. So just uh, one more thing here. Um, a, a lot of people have, uh, maybe in, in more intellectual debates about libertarianism, talked about the uh, contrasting arguments of deontological versus utilitarian libertarianism. And uh, I just want to say one thing about that because there, there, there are people who have said that the book kind of uh, does both. And I, and I think it's important that we, we cover both in, in reaching out to people, that we show people the utility of freedom. But also, uh, when, when you think of the utility of freedom, if you're measuring utility in, like, in widgets or in money or in something you know, more distinctly measurable like that, then you know, you're, you're, all, you're kind of taking on the role of a central planner. If you're saying that libertarianism is, is utilitarian because you get, more, uh, you, you get more widgets produced and therefore more people are happy, um, you're, you're, assuming, you're, you're making an assumption between widgets and happiness. And the book kind of covers both, uh, but really goes more into the deontological arguments, although I really hate that word because nobody knows what the fuck it means. But the arguments of morality and universal principles, because when you talk about those principles, there's a utilitarian element as well, but the measure of utilitarianism at that point is respect for the human will and the ability to maximize human happiness by its own definition, by the divine desires of the individual. And I think that's reflected in the book, and I guess I'll just conclude with that and say thank you very much for sticking with me through this incredible drunken ramble. And I've just, I, I haven't had a chance like this, Marianne, since I wrote the book to really present it like this, even in my own podcast. So it's been a lot of fun, and holy crap, it's been exciting to see all of these um, chats scrolling through and people drinking with me so I don't know if you want to bring people on or if you just want to throw questions at me but let's do it all right so now we're going to Q&A so if you have any questions there is a questions tab and I know we already have a few already so let's get started all, all right. right the first one has popped up do you want me to just start reading this I'll let you read it you have such a prettier voice than me <laughs> How do you talk to a cop who is actually a great person and who thinks his job is courageous? Oh, that's such a good question, and there's so much to that. And I, I, I do want to point out one of my videos that we did recently about uh, challenging DUI checkpoints that we did here in Glendale, California. And some, uh, I think it was Cop Block. And by the way, shout out to copblock.org uh, for what they do. Uh, for saying that it was one of the greatest examples of having an exchange with a cop, and I actually got him to really admit that the you know the system is corrupt and protects you know all the bad cops. Um, but how do you how do you talk to them? I mean, talk to them like a human being. Uh, first of all, if they think their job is courageous, there's some facts that you can throw at them, and if you, if you you know understand that hey, you're eight times more likely to be killed by a cop than by a terrorist, that puts things in perspective for the average American. But for a cop, you know, who thinks that their job is dangerous, and this is really one of like the great social myths in America that being a cop is dangerous and courageous. And and and, and like to be fair, there are cops that are that are well intentioned, that uh, that that really do courageous things on a regular basis to help people and go out of their way to help people. And you know, cheers to them. But as I said in this video. There's no such thing as a good cop because even a good cop is part of a system that protects bad cops. So one of the things that you can point out to them is that being a cop is not even among one of the top 10 most dangerous professions in the United States. And that's, uh, that's an important statistical thing to point out. But is that really going to win them over? Not necessarily. And, and here's the other thing that, that's important to separate, I think, when, when talking to cops is to say... Uh, is to, to recognize the legitimate services that they do provide. Uh, providing for the public safety, keeping bad actors accountable, stopping violent criminals. And I know everybody libertarians are going to say, oh, what, Adam, you love cops? No, 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 no. But like, let's try to separate 
the legitimate services that they provide from the illegitimacy of the system and separate them as individual human beings. So, I mean, how do you talk to them? Get them to read the book. Get them to read Freedom. Uh, because there's there are plenty of sections that, that really, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Marion, for that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, get all you got to add, the answer to every question is get all of the people involved to read Freedom, and then everything will be okay. Um, but, but no, on a serious level, it's like, yeah, this is how you, how you talk to people, is respect them as human beings, respect them as individuals. And I, I think that's something that's, that's missed by a lot of libertarians, especially in, in reaching out to cops, because they are the strongmen of politicians. They are enforcing the will of politicians at the barrel of a gun. So, you know, how do you get past that? Well, it's, it's really, a, and, and this is kind of taking it off the immediate subject of the question, but it's about forgiveness and understanding and compassion. And if you understand that uh, someone who engages in psychopathic behavior or sociopathic behavior is someone who is incapable of normal, loving, connected relationships, well, you know, what do you do? You give them what they can't provide, love and connectedness. Or love and understanding. All right, so other. I'm going to go to the bottom of the list. This is a fun one. Has anyone called you an Illuminati plant based on the triangles on the top and bottom of your new Freedom logo? <laughs> you know, it says that he's not serious, but I that could be a very legitimate question given libertarians. <laughs> Read the book and you won't be asking that question. Oh uh, no, it's um I think the logo is really badass. I spent I'll, I'm going to take this as an opportunity to just plug this badass fucking logo that we came up with, which I did. By the way, 99designs, great website, 99designs.com. That's how we got started with this. I put a lot of effort into honing this and I I got I got to get another plug out. For the guys that do our merchandise, it's wheretoprint.com, and these guys do, um, <laughs> I got 99 designs and a bitch ain't one. Thank you, David Montgomery from the chat. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, they, they really helped uh, tweak this design, but wheretoprint.com, these guys are, are, are running my merchandise operation now. They do an amazing job. And they want to be the printers for the freedom movement. So if anybody else has any printing needs or whatever, I, I definitely want to endorse them. They are, are people who believe in the message and understand what we're doing. Um, the, the logo, I mean, I mean, it's badass enough that someone already got it tattooed on their body and the book hasn't even been out for like two months. Come on. They just li and this, the, the, the tattoo was from someone who described themselves as apolitical and just listened to the audio book. So come on. That's like, it's just... I'm I'm floored, uh, but no, I, I'm I'm seriously as soon as I can afford it. This is an expensive tattoo I'm talking about, but I'm gonna get this entire logo all the way across my back from shoulder to shoulder. So hey, donate AdamVersusTheMan.com if you want to see that. Maybe we'll have a, a, a tattoo Kickstarter, but uh, or crowdfunder, whatever the hell. Um, but no, uh, the the logo is something that makes it distinct and universal. I put a lot of thought into this. Um, as something that could be a, a brand for freedom. Um, and one of the cool things, again, about the internationalization of this, the, the, the global applicability, is that you can put any word in here. You know, you can put it in a different language. And it's a font and a frame, and it's distinct and recognizable. And you can take the filigree on top and stretch it or put it on sides and put it on... Okay, that's enough. Um, I Bumper stickers. Say, if any of you... If any of you want to jump on video chat, go ahead and um, hit Don't video be shy. chat. And this is just to ask your question, and I should be able to pick on you. Or not pick on you. I don't want to pick on you. I should be able to choose you and put you on screen. Okay, so we're going to go with the next question. Richard asks, sadly, I ask, where do I buy that t-shirt? The Freedom line.com okay all right would you be willing to do or to join a google hangout after the class 
This is the Google Hangout. Oh, Google Hangout's a pain in the ass. Fuck that. Okay. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm really like I'm really easily accessible. You know, you can email me Adam at Adam versus the man dot com. You can you can hit me up on Twitter. Um, fuck Facebook, by the way. Just by the way, I'm trying to get away from Facebook. I'm and I'm finally addicted to Twitter, which I love. So at Adam Kokish, find me on Twitter. Um, but no, it's I'm I'm. I'm See, there's, okay, there's celebrity, there's political celebrity, there's internet celebrity, and then there's internet political celebrity, and, and then somewhere there's me. Like, I'm not that hard to get a hold of, I'm not that hard, you know, I'm not that hard to reach. Um, seriously, email me. Actually, after this, I have, I have people waiting for me in my living room, um, we're planning a divorce party, and... Uh, um, I've got some I've got some business meetings after this, but as long as people are asking questions, we'll keep going. All right. Ryan asks, are you worried that your comments regarding the Las Vegas officers who were killed will drive away people from libertarianism? That's such you know, like you can evaluate that video if you wanna evaluate that video in particular as to um, its effectiveness. I was kind of liberal baiting with that video, and that was kind of an Adam versus the man thing rather than a freedom thing. And like I said, I think I've, I've matured past that, even if only in the last few months with killing Adam versus the man. So I, I don't think that's gonna drive people away. Like, again, it's, it's really, it's funny, as much as we're an individualist movement, and, and again, it's, as individualist as opposed to collectivist, I don't really like that split because um, you can describe libertarianism as being about the relationships between people, and in that sense, totally collectivist, and that it's about you know nonviolent relationships. But um, I don't know. Read the comments, see the results. You can judge my individual videos, but I, I don't think you can. If, if libertarianism is the truth, and the truth is that people can get along better in nonviolence than in violence then you can't really hurt the truth. All right. Do you think a crisis, such as an economic one, is needed to change the course of statism? Hmm, no. It's not needed, but there are going to be more economic crises. People are evolving in their thinking anyway. People are reading freedom, you know? People are, are getting the message, with or, with or without this book. Um, this is the evolution of human thought. Uh, I think an economic crisis will get more people thinking and, and provides an opportunity for those of us who have already embraced the message and, 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 and already care about it to reach out to people who are thinking along these lines and looking for answers, but is it necessary? No going to happen anyway but it's inevitable and you know i think of the evolution towards a, a voluntary society as a global phenomenon so you might see like revel like is it a revolution no, no 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 it's an evolution so you might see revolutions at a local level or at, a, at, at certain governmental levels like you might see a revolution in the united states if we elect someone you know on, on the platform of dissolving the united states federal government to president, you know, that might be described as a revolution in the United States. But in the global perspective, you know, what are we, 330 million out of 7 billion something, 700, 7 and a quarter billion people on the planet? Like, no, nah, you, you look at it in the bigger perspective, it's an evolutionary process. And the uh, economic crises that we are going to experience between now and the point at which we establish a voluntary society when uh, the only economic crises will, will be much smaller based on, you know, market aberrations rather than, you know, government manipulation, um, are, 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 you know, might help in the process in, in terms of waking people up, but no, I don't, I don't think that's um, a necessary thing. I think seeing it in those terms is kind of narrow-minded. Yeah, I think it's incredibly dependent upon each person. I don't think that you can say that there's one thing that's going to change everything. Yeah, that's a very good point because uh, there there are a lot of other crises. I mean, look at look at uh, for example what's happening in Israel and Gaza right now, right? 
and how I, I think, in a sense, Israel has worn out its welcome in a lot of countries, and in a lot of the, the pro-Israel sentiment has finally gone like, uh, no, I don't think so, after this. And that's gotten a lot of people thinking. So there, there are a lot of different things, though, that are going to prod people. Uh, you look at what's happening with, like, in, in the wake of the killing of uh, Michael Brown in uh, Ferguson, Missouri. And, yeah, Missouri. Uh, where, I, I, like, when I read about that story, I was like, oh, I wish we had a freedom quick reaction force. And I, I see these people, like, you know, gnashing their teeth and in, in, in anger and in protest and uh in in grief thinking oh we got to turn to the system for justice and it's like no i wish i could be there and be like no please read this book please don't don't get angry don't riot don't loot don't don't even turn to the system that we live under for justice but start practicing agorism start living differently start separating yourself from the systems of violence and coercion All right, the next question. What will history textbooks say about the next 50 years of U.S. politics? Hmm. Well, one of the things I, I, I think about a lot that I think this book, Freedom, reflects is the seeing past the collectivism of statism you know so the question is of american politics like who the hell cares about american politics in 50 years it'll be hey remember politics that thing we used to do that was so destructive about collectivism and seeing ourselves as members of a tribe based on government and violent monopolies and circumstances of history and imaginary lines drawn on a map by politicians and wars and blah 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 and you know the, the so the next 50 years of american politics i in sorry what was that anyway oh, in, I in that I, I muted sorry <laughs> no in that context i i think the next 50 years of american politics will be seen as the psychopathic death spiral like Hey, remember those Americans when they got all fucking crazy towards the end of American dominance of the world and they started like, you know, doing this crazy border stuff and that was an issue and they were like all insecure about blah, blah, blah and like they, they were lashing out at people and trying to maintain their power and they were killing innocent people abroad and, you know, they were, they were you know, losing their power. I, I think it'll, it'll be seen as kind of... Um, the end, you know, the, the end of the last empire. At least that's what I'm hoping. So there, there will be some significance to the next 50 years of American history, but it's not going to be, you know, in an American context. It's going to be in that new global context. And I don't mean to say global government, but in a, you know, a global concept of the, you know, human family and seeing our, seeing that, you know, this is one of the things in the book. It's uh, go team people. And, and I think people are going to see themselves, uh, you know, able to connect with people across borders a lot more than they are today in a, in a sense that's isolated. So the next 50 years of American history will be seen as uh, the death of an empire. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, if you understand what a psychopath is, you know, someone who is incapable of normal, loving, connected relationships, someone who is, um, you know, without conscience someone who lies, cheats, and steals, and kills without remorse. I mean, that kind of describes government pretty well, doesn't it? There's a, there's a pattern to psychopathic behavior as well of, you know, latching on to a victim and then exploiting that victim and then a sort of self-destruct or, or discard cycle. And it's more about society discarding the, the psychopaths who, who are in charge of government in general but um, I think that's I think that's how it's going to be seen. Is like I, I mean I, I in all of my readings recently, and and, and I, this is based on my experience of getting rid of of several sociopaths or psychopaths in my life recently. Which is uh, by the way, if people want that whole story, uh, there's going to be a book in a few years. But uh, you can listen to my podcast from a few weeks ago. 
that uh, describes at least in sort of vague terms about that experience and how, how I got rid of these people. And um, I, I've learned a lot from the experience. I'm really, I'm really grateful for it. But I, I mean, for those of you that don't know, basically my best friend, the guy I thought was my best friend of the last year and a half, turned out to be a con man. And that's a that's a pretty pretty heavy experience. I mean, it's almost as traumatizing as being in combat in ways a lot more so. And if you understand the sort of psychological manipulations that sociopaths and psychopaths are capable of, it's a it's a pretty intense experience. And just so, so people know, definitions wise, um, I've been talking about psychopaths. And that's generally by the psychological establishment, for what that's worth. About 1% of the population of people who are completely incapable of love and connectedness in their relationships with other human beings. I recently read a book called The Sociopath Next Door. Again, another book that I highly recommend as long as we're in a author's forum here at liberty.me slash you. Um, I'm sure me, you, has been abused is a joke all too many times by Jeffrey Tucker, so I'm not going to go there. But uh, the sociopath next door describes the definition as people who have no conscience, and it's actually about 4% of the American population. Crazy thing is that in other populations, it's like half a percent or less, so it's, 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 it is somewhat cultural. I would ascribe that a lot of that to statism, you know, uh, as encouragement or institutionalization of sociopathic behavior. Uh, but when you go through an experience like that and you have sociopaths or psychopaths in your life that you have to get rid of, you learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about uh, how to deal with people and about the nature of evil in the world. And it's actually really kind of encouraging when you go, this is the worst of human evil. It is people that are incapable of love and connectedness. How do you fix that? More love, more connectedness. And I, I, I think I've come out of this experience for the better. So am I still answering a question or am I just rambling now? <laughs> yeah, we actually have a video question, so I'm going to go ahead and put him on air right now. Excellent. This is not a video question. I don't know why I'm here. I was just looking at my face and fixing my mustache. <laughs> well, you have a beautiful mustache, sir. Well, thank you. Hello, Mr. Coach. Well, now, you that you're, now that you're on air, do hey, you if, I, if I may, if I may. Well, hold on, Anthony, if I may interject. One of the best things, I should say the best thing about the freedom movement right now is that we have the best facial hair of all political movements in America, bar none. Just want to point that out, so cheers. To your mustache. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, Anthony. All right, I'm going to take you off video now. You got it. No, 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 he's got a question. No, Anthony, what's your I question? question you just oh, have a do mustache. You remember me? I'm not sure was your mustache um, looking like that because when I met you I would have remembered no we never met in person I was the one that sent the email I think there was a misunderstanding there because I sent the email probably to an inactive email but you might not remember it all right <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. Sorry about it. And for sharing your <laughs> cut him off. Like, <laughs> His facial hair is pretty epic. Okay. It is. All right. Next question is from Andrew David. Other than your less confrontational nature, how will freedom, Adam, be different than Adam versus the man? What are your future plans? <sighs> Well, I, w I will describe that in some non-committal terms because there are some big plans being discussed behind the scenes here as to what's going to happen with uh, with with Mr. I, I, I guess I, I should change my last name to Freedom, right? Free I, and by the way, it's all caps with an exclamation mark don't in every do format, that. just Please to be clear. Please don't do that. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> wait, wait. You How many people would do it? <laughs> I mean, that's a great idea. You should definitely do that. That sounds like a wonderful plan. 
<laughs> and then people can just call me Mr. Freedom, right? No. How many, well, how many people in the movement go by, you know, fake surnames of, like, Freeman? I mean, I'm not going to... I can't do that. I would, go, who would go by a fake surname. I would never do that. Wait a second, Marianne. This isn't... <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think so. I'm putting you on the spot because I know you... I knew you until today as what? Um, I have no clue. I don't know. Libertarian girl? <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea what your real name is. You were just that, that hot chick who goes by Libertarian girl. So don't tell me well, that, that you don't have... But I didn't legally change my name, so I guess it's a, you can totally adopt you know, a persona, but whether you should legally change your name, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a uh, bit extreme. Yeah. Oh, oh, so the state recognized legal name. That's what's extreme. What are you? Some kind of yeah. Status? I mean, you, you would, yeah, you'd be a huge status if you legally change your name. <laughs> as opposed to, okay. As opposed to just like changing it for practical purposes and just doing whatever I wanted with it. Okay. So you can call me Adam freedom if you want. Uh, no, but what are, what are the plans? You know, I, I really don't know, but I, like I said, this book is not, I'm, I'm not, like, I, I hope that from people who have been tuning in so far um, get a sense of this, I, I, I didn't, and, and again, I didn't really realize this until the book was out. I don't care about anything else in life more than getting people to read this book and embrace the message and understand freedom. So everything I do from now on, and please call me on it if it's not true to this, is about getting people to read the book. I'm, I'm trying to get, oh, I think I skipped over this earlier. Um, oh, no, no, I mentioned it. Like getting people to sponsor a print run of the book for less than $5,000. We don't have the exact number right now, but... For less than five thousand dollars, you can get five thousand copies of the book printed, with you know the entire inside of the front cover, with your advertising and the back page with your advertising. And I will personally hand them out to people and get them out there because that's how much I believe in this right now. I what I've been thinking of is how to be a monk for freedom, like really how to live up to this. It's not like I, mean, I understand how having a book is like having a kid. You know, and, and, and birthing it into the world and, and, and you, know, so, you know, having that attitude towards it. But for me, this, this first book is more than that. And, and, and if, if I may, Marianne, um, one of the things that I, that I have in my notes that I didn't get into, I'm going to pull this up here on my, my forums, on my other monitor here, forums.adamversustheman.com, under the, uh, the, the Freedom Forum. And, and I really, really encourage anybody who, who cares about spreading this message and being a part of this community to join the conversation here at the forums. There's a thread called the Encyclopedia of Freedom. And what I intend to do is write, at least right now, it's 16 more books based on this idea, based on this format in terms of being about 100 pages very plain language, easily accessible, philosophically consistent, non-judgmental, so on and so forth. And right now I've got, the first one is called Enjoying Freedom, Health Freedom, Economics of Freedom, Achieving Freedom, Justice and Freedom, Nature and Freedom, Youth and Freedom, Science of Freedom, World Freedom, Intellectual Freedom, Educational Freedom, Relationship Freedom, Techno Freedom, Ethics of Freedom, History of Freedom, Spiritual Freedom, and then this one isn't really in the series, but the 17th book would be American Freedom, describing the presidential platform of dissolving the American federal government entirely in four years. And the reason that wouldn't be part of the series is that the series has to be globally applicable. And I'm really excited about this, but uh, it's going to be a while uh, before all these books come out, but this is... Uh, this is, this is, you know, a lot of people need need a little bit more intellectual coverage, if you will, before fully embracing freedom. And so, 
that's uh that's what I'm doing. Yeah, we'd love to hear your um your plan to dissolve the federal government. I think that'd be very be very interesting to hear and hard to convince people of. It's, not that I'm not, against you know it, what? I'm all for it, but Hold on. Yeah, exactly. See, you're all for it. Hold on, Marion. What what kind of like outreach have you done on the street to, to average Americans? Um, I mean, I do political party stuff, and I go to meetings and events, and so you talk to the mean? already indoctrinated and propagandized, and the most steeped in the bullshit. No, of the uh, I'm a Republican, so they are not like that kind of. They're not libertarians already. They definitely need a lot of work. But yeah, exactly. So I'm not a member yeah, of the Libertarian I Party. I sacrifice myself. As a Republican. <laughs> I've said this for a long time. It's easier to convert the average American than the average Republican who or, or conservative who even might agree with us on a lot of, you know, superficial issues. Because most people get this. Like really, especially millennials, especially young people, especially the movers and shakers in society who have an expectation that things are gonna be different. Like they don't have any commitment to the present system. It, and they're they're open to this. The idea of like dissolving the federal government, they're like, yeah, give me the mechanics, show me how you can do it. Like, and I know you're saying like you're excited to hear it, but like it's very, uh, it, it's something that people are already very receptive to. You'd be surprised. Get out and talk no, to I, regular I, people. No, I, I believe you. I just um, yeah, I don't really go out on the streets. I talk to a lot of people online. And, you know, when I'm at events, I definitely talk to people. I wish I had the time to go out and interview people, but I just don't right now. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, sixteen 16 more questions. So, on All right, let's do it. Well, we'll go until I have, I have people waiting for me here. And when they... Uh, when they when they start barging into the studio, or I got my dog here, Blue. I should here. I'll um, introduce everybody. Blue, say hi. Blue, come here. Oh. All right. I guess that's my that's my my puppy. My my love puppy, hundred pound uh, <laughs> pit dane mix. Yes, he's he's beautiful, and uh, truly a love puppy in in the spirit of the moon. But yeah, as soon as um. Either he, it, it, if he starts looking like he's gonna poop in the studio, or people start barging in here, then then we'll stop. <laughs> all right. All right. This when is, is from it Tony always Styles. Call the police. Oh man, that's a good question. That's really tough. And you know what? I've grappled with that myself in a, in a lot of specific situations. Um, it, it, if you understand what the police. Are who they are, what they represent. Um, then it's really easy to answer that question. But obviously, if you if you can apply force yourself um, legitimately and uh, justly, and 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 um, you know that makes sense for you, then you shouldn't call the police. I mean, really, basically. You should avoid, it, it, it's not when should you call the police. The question I think is better answered as when should you not call the police. And that's answered by understanding who they are, what they are, who they represent, and the upsides and downsides of that. And I, I, that's probably too long of a question to, to really com completely answer in this context. But um, if you can handle the situation yourself, Obviously, don't call the police. Um, if you have some, you know, if you have a dead body, you probably should call the police. Unfortunately, because if you don't, then the consequences are worse. So, I mean, you really just—it's it, that's a really tough question to answer because you'd have to write an entire book just to answer that question, like for this scenario or that scenario. But if you understand who and what the police are as the enforcers of government policy. And you understand that they are a perversion of the legitimate service of providing for the public safety and providing accountability for violent criminals. 
um, you know, than there is a time. But then, you know, you, you, you got to weigh it for the individual situation. There, there's no, like, you know, hard and fast rule for when you should and when you shouldn't call the police. Because, like, if your car is stolen and you need a police report to cover your insurance or for whatever bullshit that is, then, yeah, you know, call, call the police. But if you can avoid calling the police, yeah, avoid calling the police. Yeah, my rule of thumb is only when it's a situation that I absolutely cannot handle myself. Or when someone's yeah, like, that, in that's a good and way. I can't do anything to stop it. Okay. There we go. Do you think that we should be involved with the political system, voting, running for office, etc.? That's a that's a, that's a really big question. I think any kind of activism that reduces the coercion in society is worthwhile. So if you can run for county dog catcher and you can somehow respect people's property rights more by holding that office, then it's totally worthwhile. The other thing about this, so there's the, the I have I have like two. Two analyses of, uh, in, in terms of answering this question. One, can you expect to practically reduce the coercion in society by holding an office? And if you can, go for it. If you really think you can have some positive effect as city council, as mayor, as whatever it is, go for it. If it's worth the effort and if it's not, Worse than say, actually, you know, converting people one on one, getting people to read freedom, right? Because it's, it's all about it's all about the book. Um, the second thing is if you can use the platform to wake people up. And again, I think Ron Paul showed how you can do that, uh, and, and he did it in an exemplary manner in terms of taking advantage of the platform to wake people up. And it's like, hey. The government is stealing from you to make itself relevant to pay for all of this. So if you can jump up on that platform and take advantage of it and say, nah, we're going to use this to wake people up instead of to further propagandize people and you can run an educational campaign for those purposes, absolutely, go for it. Thank you. I, I completely agree with that. I catch a lot of flack because... I'm a Republican, when I'm really an anarchist, and I know that doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but me, yeah, it does. And I gotcha. <laughs> All right. Do you think that we should be involved with the political... Oh, wait, no. Crap. Same question. Yeah, Sorry. we covered Scratch that. Out. <laughs> All right. This should be an interesting one. Do you think Christianity is compatible with anarchism? Does God's rule count? Absolutely. Christianity is compatible with anarchism, with voluntarism, with true libertarianism. There's no contradiction there in and of itself. When you define libertarianism simply as the non-aggression principle and self-ownership, and I have to say, there are a lot of Christians, and, and I'm an atheist, but there are, and I don't really like that label, but you know, I, I, I'm um, sort of anti-dogma of any kind. But uh, there are a lot of Christians who are true to those core principles based on their faith, and I think that's very important to recognize that a lot of people are motivated to libertarianism based on that. However, I will say that for myself, at a deeper level of philosophy, there is a contradiction. And for me, libertarianism is a conclusion of an objectivist or philosophical worldview. And in that sense, I, I do see a contradiction. But because what's most important for, humu for moving humanity forward right now is embracing universal nonviolence for people who are Christians, for whom their Christianity motivates them to that, who are philosophically consistent in that, I don't think there is a contradiction. I think it's very important that, that those of us who are atheist or anti-religious, even libertarians, because of our philosophical grounding, that we embrace and welcome Christians into the movement of uh, achieving a society based on universal nonviolence. For whatever, you know, and, and I describe 
uh, religion or faith is, is sort of wishful thinking, filling in the unknowns. And I know that might sound really harsh to a lot of Christians. But again, I certainly respect that, especially for Christians who recognize that what they believe in is faith and that that is separate from how we look at the world objectively. And if we come to the same conclusion, and from for them it's from faith, and their conclusion is that we should get along through nonviolence, then we should absolutely welcome and embrace that. And in that case, in, in, in that exact understanding, there is no contradiction whatsoever. And I, I think for those for whom Christianity represents nonviolence, I think it's important that we respect that their faith leads them to libertarianism and, and really welcome them in that, rather than create some artificial divide through our you know, deeper philosophical understanding. Yeah, I think it depends on what your God is telling you to do. If your God is telling you to stone gay people, that's not consistent with libertarianism. But if you're not doing any harm to anyone, I don't see why Christianity or any religion wouldn't be compatible. Absolutely. Do I need to waste time talking about liberty on people who are interested only in what Kim Kardashian ate for breakfast? Well, this morning she had three eggs with a spinach omelet with a little kale and uh, garlic and uh, two slices of turkey bacon. So um, I think it is important that we embrace these people as well. No, it's, 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 it's even more important that we reach out to those people and that we show them that there are more important things to be interested in. I mean, like, it, well, well, what's the alternative? You're going to say, oh... Fuck you, you're a celebrity worshiper. I don't want to have anything to do with you. And this is like, hey, you don't do politics? That's cool. Politics will keep doing you. And if, if that's your attitude towards celebrity culture, to the people that are you know, engaged in that, then you're just cutting people off. No, those are the people that are most important to engage, that have the most to benefit and the most to gain from taking a, a, a deeper philosophical worldview. So uh, and I... I and this is something that I, I wish I could give you better answers on, you know, and I, and I hope to be developing the, these over the next, you know, few months of doing outreach with this book. But people like that are the ones that are in the most need of hearing the message of, of you know, getting a deeper engagement with the world. So absolutely, you know, if anything, it, it, it should be the greatest a challenge for the libertarian movement in terms of low-hanging fruit. I'd rather convert the Kardashian worshippers, watchers, whatever you want to call them, than the average conservative who even already agrees with us on most issues. Because if you think about it, the people that are paying attention to the Kardashians, guess what? They're not paying attention to the Palins and the Bidens and the Obamas. They're already a step ahead in a sense in that they go, hey, this isn't relevant to us. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And in a way, they're practicing a kind of, maybe this is going too far, but intellectual agorism. And if we can just lead them to connecting that to a slightly deeper philosophical understanding of freedom, we can get them to practicing real agorism and real, uh, you know, having a, a lifestyle that is truly disconnected from the propaganda. And if you recognize that, you know, celebrity culture is a distraction from politics or from more important issues, then the people that are letting themselves be distracted, in a sense, are a step ahead of the assholes that are saying, well, we're going to go team red or go team blue, and those people, you know, are a little harder to convert. So I think those people, and, and like I said, I, people, people that are of that mentality are the people that I wrote this book for. Remember, this is an author's forum, not, not just a drinking forum, okay, people? Um, there, so I, I really, I, I would hope that the book, as a free audio book, you know, is something that you could get a celebrity worshiper to engage with and see like, okay, well, hey, guess what? I have fun following the Kardashians. Big deal. Maybe someday they'll evolve past that. But if anything, it's easier to get them to pay attention and listen than somebody who's already got their head halfway up Obama's ass. Because if they don't have their head halfway up Obama's ass, it's up Ted Cruz's ass or Rand Paul's ass or wh whoever the next, you know... Political celebrity worship is probably worse than Kardashian-style celebrity worship. Okay, we're going to do two more. We have so many questions. Um, we're going to do two more questions, and we will have to have you be back sometime. Good, because I'm, I'm, right. I'm like, I'm half a bottle in here. <laughs> okay. 
How how are you going? What what were you drinking again? Jameson in a in a what bottle? In a what cup? In my my little pony cup. Jameson was it straight I'm, Jameson? I'm a huge fan. Um, yeah. So, but I'm a huge fan of of bronies. Like not like I'm not a brony. I'm just a really huge fan of subcultures. So like bronies are one of my favorite subcultures. So yeah, I really like bronies. And I just said that on camera. Um, <laughs> okay, so our next question is, do you think that using government services can help bankrupt government and thus quicken their end? Yes, yes, thank you for bringing it up, absolutely, and I, I debated this for a while, and while I, while I had a TV show at RT, I remember Tom Hartman, does, does, do people know who Tom Hartman is, the, the great liberal lion of independent media with the, the radio show, whatever, Tom Hartman. He was like, oh, well, Iran took government social security and blah, 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 blah. So therefore her entire philosophy is invalid. And I was like, huh? Really? No, no, no. I think it's actually important. I thought about this a lot before putting it in the book. Remember, this is, this is an author's form. I'm an author. For reals. Um, no, so I thought, of, uh, th that means that I think about stuff. I, I thought about this a lot before I wrote the book. I think it's actually very important that those of us who care about freedom do everything we can to take money away from government. It's not just about agorism and not paying taxes. If you can take money away from government without contributing to its taking of money, if government has to you know, put money on the table to maintain its credibility, we take that money off the table it's less dollars that they can use for the police state or for war or for whatever other propaganda bullshit that they want to put it towards. So absolutely, if you qualify for welfare, uh, you know, I, I, people like to make fun of me. And this is like, I guess I see this from the trolls every now and then. Oh, Adam's a disabled veteran. He gets money from the government. Fuck yes, I do. I am professionally insane with PTSD. Although, again... Let's take the D off of there. It's just post-traumatic stress. It's not a disorder. Uh, but no, I like yeah. If you can take money away from the government, do it. If you if you do it in a way that's not encouraging them to take more, absolutely get that money away from them that they might have to use or they might get to use for the police state or for war or for anything else. So like take what you can get. Now th there is one little caveat to that, which is don't be dependent. Uh, but you know, if you know that you can be independent, if you're capable of supporting yourself despite whatever government benefits you're getting, yeah, go for it. Do it. There's no shame in that whatsoever, especially when the government has taken so much from all of us and takes so much in opportunity costs, takes so much in taxes, takes so much in the violence of the state. Yeah, get back what you can. All right, last question. What's the easiest thing we can do to make the world a freer place? Well, have I not made this clear already? <laughs> the easiest, simplest, most effective thing that you can do to get people to embrace the message, to make the world a better place, a less violent place, a more harmonious, loving, and cooperative place is to get people to read or listen to freedom. Boom. I'm out. All right. <laughs> All right. Is there any any closing remarks you, could, you would like to make before I give my, my last feel? Well, yes. On a, on a, <laughs> if I may put a sort of serious follow-up to that answer, um, it's, it's not just about the book, although I would hope that everybody would consider this. I wrote the book to be the ultimate outreach and conversion tool. And from the survey of the literature that I've done, I'm very confident saying I succeed. Excuse me. That's the gin talking. I hope everybody's keeping up with me. But I really doubt it because I'm like, I don't even want to show how far into this bottle I am. Um, seriously though, this this book is uh, you know if you don't think that it's the most effective outreach and conversion tool, write a better version. And I'm dead serious. Like, copy it, rip it, change a couple words, put your own name on the cover, whatever the hell it is that you want to do. Wake people up, get people to embrace this message. Freedom as defined as universal nonviolence. 
this is how we move humanity forward. And if, if you don't think it's this book, seriously, like, you know, you better be doing something that's more effective as, as, as a direct outreach tool, as, as, as a way to wake people up. So, uh, you know, please, uh, for the people that, 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 that already get this, I, I want you to read it, not to, to be converted or to have some intellectual exercise, but to behold it as a tool, as something that is a, an, an effective way of converting people. And it, it's broader than that, you know, and, and a lot of us have a very high intellectual standard. I mean, if you're listening to me right now, I mean, heck, if you've been with me, what is it now? Almost, almost two hours? Holy crap, we went over time. Um, you know, uh, you're, you're probably at a much deeper intellectual level than the average human being, than the average American, although I, I, would, I would like to think that that you know, standard of intellectualism is increasing with technology and the Internet in, in a global sense. But, but seriously, it, it doesn't take that much, you know. I mean, wear the T-shirt, rock the stickers, share the book. It's free, it's online, it's digital in every format possible for free, including as an audio book. Get it out there, get people to listen to it, wake people up, share it with people. Um, if you can get to thefreedomline.com, that's our website now, thefreedomline.com. You can pre-order 100 packs of the book with a t-shirt and a tote bag for 139 bucks. Because all we care about is getting the message out. That is so much more important to us than, than making money or anything else. At least to me, that's, that's, that's really all I care about. So I, I hope that you would care the same way, and I hope that you would think the same way about how we move humanity forward, how we evolve to a voluntary society, how we have fun doing it, how it makes our lives better. And, and this is the cool thing about this and about this book and about the message as, as, as I've captured it. And I think it's, it's not me. It's just what I've brought into this particular work that is the book Freedom of, of all of the best of libertarianism, of all of the best of the message of freedom, but also about how it makes our lives better. And instead of saying, join me in my fear and my anger and my depression, we can say, join me in my love and my peace and my happiness and my joy in having understood this and wanting to share it with other people. And I hope that you would join me in wanting to be a part of moving humanity forward in this way. I want to say sincerely thank you because you have been incredibly positive, which is definitely not something that we, um, we see from libertarians a lot. So. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry we ran over. I hope everybody enjoyed it, even though we did run over quite a bit. Um, this week, we've got Rick Rule teaching a four-part series on investing. So I hope that you guys will join us. And to check out the rest of our classes, just go to libertyme.classes. And I will see you guys all again soon. Thank you, Adam. <laughs>